Hi, I'm Susan Colley, and welcome to your Disability Connection. Considering college after high school for a student with a disability is a decision that requires comprehensive thought and preparation. Here to discuss post-secondary education for the disabled is Susan Woods, retired Associate Dean, Student Support Services, Middlesex Community College. Hi, Susan. How are you? Good, Susan. How are you? Good. Delighted to be here. Good. Well, can you tell us a little more about yourself? Absolutely. So I um, recently retired. I was at Middlesex Community College for 27 years, um, and I was an Associate Dean of Student Support Services, which meant that I oversaw services for about 1,000 students with documented disabilities, wow. as well as oversaw two alternative programs, mm -hmm. a transition program and an inclusive concurrent enrollment program, and also was involved in delivering support to first-generation, low-income, and students with disabilities. Wow. So it was an exciting career. Mm -hmm. And I've recently retired, and um, I also am an adjunct, adjunct faculty at Middlesex and have been for 10 years teaching a course called Developmental Disabilities, mm -hmm. which is primarily for education majors and psychology majors, an um, overview of Intro to Special Ed. And in my retirement, I've launched a, a consulting business practice that focuses on helping individuals, families, and school systems prepare students who have documented disabilities, who've mm -hmm. been on ed plans mm -hmm. or 504 plans, to make the transition from high school to college successfully. Oh, that's a big, uh, exp uh, you know, responsibility, I would say. <laughs> it's exciting work, and it's, it's really my passion. <laughs> Well, what is the difference between uh, services under the high school IEP or 504 um, plan versus um, the services that are offered by the um, universities and colleges? Well, it's, 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 there's significant differences. Um, I could talk about it for, for a long time, but succinctly, um, the best way to explain it is that the individual ed plan or the high school 504 plan does stop once the student leaves right. the high school environment. Right. But something else, a process comes in place. The laws that dictate what happened in high school versus the laws that dictate what happened in post-secondary education are different. So IDEA, which is the Individuals with Dis Disability Education Act, um, covers the K through 12 world. The Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA, is mm -hmm. what is um, part of the compliance for colleges and universities. I see. Some of the major differences are that a student is driving the process. So different than perhaps in, in high school. In the ADA, when I'm, they go to high a, school. In a post-secondary environment. Right. So in high school and, and K through 12, oftentimes family members and the student is a participant perhaps, but not necessarily driving the bus, so to speak. Right. In a college environment, the student has to request accommodations. They have to provide documentation to support the request. Mm -hmm. And then there's an interactive process that involves the student and the disability office of the college or university that basically creates an accommodation plan that creates um, what sort of accommodations will essentially level the playing field for that student in a post-secondary environment. Well, what happens if um, the person with the disability um, cannot communicate to the, um, uh, to the office where well, they need to. <laughs> that's a great question, Susan, and I guess that's part of the preparation that um, I feel strongly should happen before a student considers going to college. Right. Um, there's many different ways that a student can communicate. What most colleges, all colleges, actually any college or university that receives even a penny of money from the federal government via financial aid must comply with the ADA. Mm -hmm. So the first step is for a student and their family to figure out what the process is. Okay. And there's some best, best practices out there. And basically, the student post-admission has an opportunity to communicate to the college and university that they have a disability or they have a challenge. Mm -hmm. And then what rolls into that is the process. And the student basically completes a form, provides documentation, and that begins the interactive process. Mm -hmm. A student then would sit down with a member of the disability staff um, if they want a parent to accompany them. That's certainly something okay. that would be accommodated. Okay. But the student is at the center. I see. Um, and different than K through 12, the students are over 18. 
Mm -hmm. They're treated as an adult. Right. And certainly there can be people in the background coaching them through mm -hmm. the process. Mm -hmm. um, but in a perfect world, that has happened before they left high school, so they're well, well prepared for how to approach the college and university. Okay. Well, um, what disabilities receive accommodations under the ADA and the 504 of the Rehab Act? Okay. Well, it's a very broad um, interpretation. Actually, when the ADA was reauthorized in 2001, they even broadened it more. So some of the disabilities that I was experienced with, that um, basically a disability under the ADA is anything that interferes with daily life activities. So it's okay. a very broad definition. It includes very thinking so. and learning and communicating mm -hmm. along with mobility and sensory. Um, Do so they have to have more than one uh, characteristic in order to uh, qualify or is it just... Basically the, the way it works is that a student identifies as having a disability and then provides documentation. Okay. And the documentation for most students would be the testing or evaluations that got the student the services in high I school. I see. Okay. So the most common disabilities that I was experienced working with, and again, we supported and accommodated about a thousand okay. students with mm -hmm. disabilities, I would say 90% of those students were individuals with invisible disabilities. Yeah. So those would be individuals that, that may be identified as having a learning disability, mm -hmm. may be identified as being on the autism spectrum, that may have a psychological, psychological or social emotional or psychiatric disability, mm -hmm. ADHD, neurological disabilities, health disabilities, things like Crohn's disease, right. um, fibromyalgia. Wow. Um, and then a smaller number, but a significant number, who would identify as having mobility, health related or sensory. So that would be students that might be blind um, or vision impaired or students that might be deaf or hard of hearing. Right, so, so there's it's a, a lot very, of... very broad spectrum. Okay. And I think that once the student has identified and provided that documentation, then that starts the, the wheels turning right. in terms of that interactive process. So what accommodations are provided and what aren't provided well, in the Well, that's a, that's a great question as well. And um, it's, it's not a cookie cutter. Um, so the accommodations are directly tied to the documentation provided. Okay, I see. But some of the typical accommodations, mm -hmm. and again, they, they are suited to the individual, but some of the um, ones that I most often saw provided would be things like extended time for test taking, mm -hmm. taking their tests or quizzes or exams in a distraction reduced environment, mm, okay. um, access to a note taker. Oh, good. If they had a sensory or a physical um, impairment, it would actually be a scribe. Somebody would come in and do their writing for oh, them. Oh, that's great. Whereas a note taker is most commonly used for individuals that may have attentional challenges I see. or processing challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, some of the other accommodations um, may be access to assistive technology. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a bunch of programs out there that assist students that may have a reading disability, that may have other types, dysgraphia, which is a writing disability, right. um, dyscalculia, which is a math disability. My so there is technology out there that students can access. Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm not as experienced with, though I talk to colleagues at um, private and public residential schools, mm -hmm. is the accommodations involved in housing at colleges, oh, but it's a similar right. process. Right. So one of the most common accommodations um, for a residential um, college would be perhaps a private room. Oh, yeah. And that also has to be supported by documentation. Although some students might fare better having a roommate. And it really, quite honestly, depends on what the student's requesting and what documentation they have that supports that request. Right. So when I talked earlier about it being a student-driven process, one of the things that's really important for the students to have an understanding about is what do they need mm -hmm. and why. Right. Um, I, countless times I would talk to students who had been on ed plans in high school, came into the office and said, I needed accommodations, but when I ask them, so what's it for? What does it help you with? Mm -hmm. So sort of peeling the onion and getting them to identify, okay, the reason I have distraction-reduced testing is 
because the way I process information, if there's a distraction, I sort of lose my content mm -hmm. and lose what I'm able to show. Right. So the accommodation is really leveling the playing field. Mm -hmm. You asked me what it doesn't do, what accommodations typically don't happen. And again, there's a lot of variation from institution to institution. There are some best practices that most institutions follow. Um, but for example, some of the things that might have been delivered in high school that might not occur in college would be things like modified curriculum. Mm -hmm. So in a college course, they're expected to know the you, full. You're expected to do the same coursework as anyone else. Mm -hmm. There may be opportunities for support, which I'll mention in a second, but there's no modification. There's no, well, everybody's doing one through 10, you only need to do one, three, five, and seven. Mm -hmm. That would be a modification. Um, there's also not modifications of things like attendance requirements. Mm -hmm. So a course, let's say it's chemistry, that right. has lab time, the student is expected to, to be, be there. There, there the is extenuating time. circumstances and those are handled case by case. Right. Um, but essentially there's not going to be an aide in the classroom mm -hmm. sitting alongside the student. Um, and there's not going so, to So in a college they don't have uh, like assistance or... Um, well, what most anyway. colleges have, and there's a lot of variation here, um, the college that I worked at, Middlesex Community College, had the capacity to provide support mm -hmm. outside the classroom. I see, so but student, not inside the classroom. Right. So a student could meet with a disability counselor who is skilled, master's degree level, um, experienced supporting students with various um, challenges, and meet on a weekly or bi-weekly ba basis to get support on how do I approach the assignment. What does not occur, which may occur in the K through 12, is having a one-on-one -on -one aid in the classroom. Oh. Um, so the student is expected to be able to interact in the classroom as any other college student, but perhaps may leave the class at the end, go see their disability counselor, and sort of begin to work on what the assignment is or how I to see. approach the work. I see. Um, the other piece is that some colleges and universities actually provide that level of support as a fee-based service. So there's oh. some wonderful private colleges um, in the Boston area that have specialized support, but that would be an additional fee, mm -hmm. whereas some colleges have it as part of the services they provide. Right. Now how does the facility uh, know about the student's disability and who is responsible for actually telling them? Well, that's a great question also. It's really that's where the student is at the center of this whole um, process. So let's imagine a student is graduating from Woburn High School and has decided to go to college and been accepted. There would be a process. Every college would have one. It would be on their website for them to disclose. Mm -hmm. So there's a process to disclose and identify, I'm an individual with a disability. Right. And then what the college or university would say is, okay, tell us what it is, mm -hmm. show us the documentation, and then let's sit down and discuss what the accommodations should be. Okay. And that's where I think family members, um, high school personnel that are working with a student could be working before they go to college to prepare them for that conversation because okay. it's an interactive process. But it's the process. individual themselves Absolutely. that tells yes. Yes. that they have the disability. Because one of the things, again, in a college environment, students are typically over 18 or even if they're 17, they're treated as an adult. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the student to make their decisions, to sort of be at the center of their communication, and also to evaluate and assess, is this working? Mm -hmm. um, so to have sort of a, um, an approach to saying, you know, I'm receiving these accommodations, or I had these accommodations in high school, this worked, this didn't. What can we cobble together to make sure that you have the equal access that you deserve? Right, right. Is there any advantage to um, s disclosing the fact that you have a disability? Well, that's a, a question I'm asked frequently. So um, having come from a community college environment mm -hmm. where it's open admission, if your viewers are not aware, community colleges are open admission with a high school diploma. So the application process per se does not require SAT scores, um, an essay, or other um, admissions criteria that's used in selective colleges. Mm -hmm. 
But the answer for some students who may be pursuing a selective college where they are going to look at the essay, they may conduct an interview, they're looking at GPA and SAT scores, my answer to that is it depends. Mm -hmm. If the disclosure pre-admission may tell a story that may help the admissions officer sort of see the student in a way um, that may make them a value to the college, perhaps it may explain Mm -hmm. um, some aspect of their transcript that maybe is not apparent. Right. Um, they can't by law know about the student's disability unless the student discloses. Okay. So that really is a, is a confidentiality and a protection. Right. Now let's take a break uh, to review um, what students with special needs should ask when considering college. I'm not going to lie to you. College is hard. I couldn't do it without my accommodations. But you can get accommodations, right? Like in high school. No, not exactly like high school. It's a different process. OK, so how does it work? Do they ask about it when you apply? No, uh, you have to contact the DSO. What's that? Oh, uh, the Disability Services Office. That's what they call it here anyway, but every campus has some place like it. It's the office that handles accommodations for students with disabilities, as the name implies. OK. Yeah, they can help you out. Um, there's this whole process you have to go through of uh, describing the disability, uh, providing documentation to prove that you have it, uh, that kind of thing. And you have to provide this stuff, not your parents. Um, and once you have all that, they decide if you're eligible. Why wouldn't I be? I don't know. Uh, it's a case-by-case -case basis kind of thing. And whatever accommodations you're getting now aren't necessarily guaranteed in college. Why not? Well, I mean, don't worry about it too much, but go talk to them first. You know, you should, like, be able to answer some basic questions, like, uh, what's your disability? <laughs> well, duh. Yeah, not a hard one. Uh, but how does it affect your learning in class, uh, when you're studying, uh, when you're doing your homework, when you're trying to finish in-class assignments and tests? Okay, what else? Um, what kind of accommodations have you had before? what's worked and what hasn't, uh, you should be able to answer any kind of questions like that before you go in and talk to them. <sighs> okay. You overwhelmed? Yeah, <laughs> just a little. It's really not that bad, but it's not exactly simple either. I mean, it would be great if you could just say, I'm disabled, and they're <laughs> like, here's everything you need, but it just doesn't work that way, you know? You have to prove that you're eligible, you have to provide current documentation. They're pretty thorough, but it's not impossible. Okay. And it's definitely not a reason to blow off college. I mean, I've been here three years and I'm doing fine. It's just part of picking the right college for you. Well, what about here? I mean, you did say it was good for you. Yeah, I do like it here. And they do a pretty good job. But I'm not a recruiter for state. You really do have to pick the one that's right for you. Just before you say yes, make sure that you investigate their accommodations. You know, check out their website, um, ask a few questions while you're on campus. Um, you can get a pretty good sense of what they can do that way. Okay. Thanks, man. Anytime. Catch you later. See ya. Now, um, are academic standards adjusted for students with disabilities? Um, essentially, no. The standards are not adjusted, but again, it's up to the student to explain to the disability office what accommodations they need. And then the process, what happens then, is that the student and the disability office develop an accommodation plan. It is then up to the student mm -hmm. to share that plan with their faculty. I see. The faculty know nothing about their disability. Mm -hmm. The actual disability itself is not named on the accommodation plan. It's mm -hmm. up to the student. But the accommodation will list some of the, the reasonable accommodations that the student is going to be entitled to, like test taking, um, like copies of class notes. Um, in some institutions where um, there may be an academic requirement that the student could pursue a waiver for particular courses based on their disability documentation. Mm -hmm. An example of that would be perhaps a foreign language waiver. Oh, if I a see. A student has a significant le learning disability that makes processing. There may be a course substitution mm 
Um, mm. One of the things I've, I've seen is that um, some institutions have substituted something like sign language for a foreign language, and mm -hmm. the student is more likely to be successful. They're not over, um, there's not going to be overall course waivers. So for example, I had many students who had challenges in math. I did as well. Um, and they might say, well, I can't do math. Can I waive the math requirement mm -hmm. to get my degree? And the answer is going to be no. Yeah. But the answer may be perhaps there is t a type of math that you're going to be more successful in that's going to meet the graduation requirements. Okay. Um, perhaps you can substitute um, for pre-calculus, you can sub substitute statistics, right. something like that. It depends on the major and it depends on the program the student is entering. So the student has to basically be prepared to fulfill all of the classwork that they need to do. Yes, and again, there may be some adjustments. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, the questions that's often raised to me is that some um, courses require public speaking. And a student that perhaps has a right, documented or, disability right. that involves anxiety, or um, autism, or autism <laughs> um, and or selective mutism, right. um, and the like, what sort of adjustments might be made? And we've worked with students, and we've worked with the faculty, and it's sort of a three-way conversation mm -hmm. of how can the student meet this requirement right. without perhaps standing in front of their classmates. They videotaped. Um, they've developed a podcast. There's mm -hmm. various ways that students have delivered that without, um, you know, modifying the requirement. Right. Um, one of, go ahead. So what can be done in uh, high school to prepare students well, uh, with disabilities? So first and foremost, um, I recommend that a student understands their disability, um, understands why they were on an IEP plan, mm -hmm. what did it do for them, and then be able to articulate their strengths mm -hmm. and their approaches, as well as articulate their challenges. Where do they hit a wall? What mm -hmm. happens when they hit the wall? What does it look like? Mm -hmm. And then what sort of accommodations have been effective in helping them mitigate right. some of those challenges? Right. Um, the other important um, skill, which is, is a difficult one for most college students, is self-advocacy. That's very difficult for a student with a disability. Yes, and so my recommendations when I work with high schools is give the student opportunities to practice that. Mm -hmm. even to the point of developing a script and having True. the student rehearse with some of their high school um, teachers about how do I advocate for myself in a way that's going to be appropriate in the college setting, right. um, but also is going to get my needs met. Because they'll be the ones that will have to go to the school and say, hey, look, this is what I need. Right, right. The other word that I use, um, it's an education word that you might hear around, is called metacognition. Um, okay. And metacognition <laughs> is essentially, it sounds very fancy, yeah. but it's essentially learning how you learn. Oh, okay. And so the more a student has an understanding and experience and understanding how they learn, what environment works best, when they're choosing colleges and thinking about colleges and visiting colleges, you know, are they going to do best in a small, cozy, rural environment, or do they do better with having... Um, an urban environment with, mm -hmm. with lots going on. Go um, the decision on whether to pursue a, a school with a residential component or to start at a community college is a very important one. Mm -hmm. um, for many students um, that I worked with, approaching things in a scaffolded approach where you sort of have a mastery at a certain level before you go up to the next level right. um, has been very effective, which mm -hmm. is why community colleges for some students is a wonderful pathway. Because mm -hmm. one of the things you may or may not realize about community colleges, especially in Massachusetts, is you can directly um, be admitted to a university after receiving an associate's degree at, at a community college. And oh, really? Any of the state colleges, universities, there's a direct direct pipeline. Wow, that's great. So with a certain great. GPA, which is like a 2.5, mm -hmm. um, you can start at a community college collect 60 credits and an associate's degree, and directly transfer into University of Massachusetts, That's great. Salem State, or any of the state universities. Now what happens, uh, or I should say, um, how can a parent help their child get accepted into school? Well, college? That, that's a great question. So I think what a parent's role is, um, is fostering some of those self-advocacy and independence skills. Mm -hmm. um, I think- And what specifically? 
could they do? Well, what specifically they could do is, is help them um, understand themselves, mm -hmm. help them understand their disability. One of the unique aspects of college or post-secondary environment is there is this law. Um, the acronym is FERPA, and FERPA stands for Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. Different than K through 12, there are limits to what a parent can do in a college and university in terms mm. of communication. Right. Um, the student is protected, and as an adult, um, the fact the parent cannot walk into the classroom and say to the professor, "Gia, why did you give me my son this grade?" or explain the assignment to me. What FERPA really protects is the student's rights. Now, students can sign what's called a FERPA release um, at, most, at all institutions, and that provides access to records. Mm. So records are basically grades. Right. It does not provide access to all aspects of their son or daughter's college experience. Okay. So what I recommend um, is to begin, begin that conversation with the disability office. Disability offices, by the way, are going to be called different names. Mm -hmm. um, some are called disability support, some are called disability services, some are called accommodation center, some are called access center. <laughs> so I recommend that families I surf know. around on the website and see and make sure they have a conversation to say, okay, what can might a parent's role be? Mm -hmm. They're most likely going to be a sage on the side mm -hmm. in that they're going to be assisting their son or daughter, but they're going to be equipping them with some of the language, right. some of the communication. Mm -hmm. One of the things I often recommend is practice writing an email. Right. Um, most college faculty respond to students via email. So learning to write a succinct, articulate email mm -hmm. is a wonderful skill to have going into the college or university. Great. Um, lastly, should a student with a disability have a counselor or other individual to help them with feeling um, overwhelmed or socially inept? Well, that's, that's a, a, an excellent question. And every college or university is set up differently. So um, again, my experience at Middlesex, we had a counseling center. Mm -hmm. um, but it served about 9,000 students. Um, so you're not going to have your one-on-one -on -one perhaps therapist or um, pragmatics coach or support person mm -hmm. maybe at the level you have in the community. My advice typically is to form a team. Um, and the team would be comprised of the Disability Services Office. Make sure you have a relationship with them. Perhaps your own private or community support mm -hmm. network. Um, one of the things that's been proven over and over again is one of the key to success for students is making one good connection. Oh, well, that's great. So whether it be an advisor, mm -hmm. a faculty. Somebody um, to support them. Somebody just to connect with and maybe help in the navigation. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that most colleges offer is um, a first year experience course. Mm -hmm. that sort of teaches the students the vocabulary, the, the how to navigate in a college environment. I think they should offer that everywhere you go yes. anyway. <laughs> but I think that um, huh. you know the students should not abandon whatever um, support they have in the community if they right. have a therapist or a pragmatics coach or a counselor and that maybe you know organize that there's some communication between that person and the college. Well, thank you very much, Susan. It's I really wonderful. enjoyed having you on the show. I enjoyed being here. Thank you so much, Susan. <laughs> Great. Take care. Um, a student with a disability can achieve their goals of attending a college or university by reaching out for support and guidance. In the end, they can be proud of their accomplishments. Hope you join us again on your Disability Connection.